<laughs> yes, we're doing pictures in the back. Hello. What's going on there, Rowdy Table? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Christmas celebration. Our hope this morning is to have some just great fellowship with each other, some worship. We're going to get to see a baptism together this morning. So excited about that. Time in the Word and then a really yummy lunch. You're going to just love it. But it, yes, it's a full morning. But first, before we get started, I want to thank Brandy and her crew for all the decorations. <clears throat> My table looks better than yours, but yours looks all right. The, the other thing is, it's just fun to look around and see some of the sweaters. I mean, I have the best sweater. You'll notice I got my shark on my, I don't know who put this up here, but that's awesome too. A shark stocking. That's, 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 in fact, that's incredible. Um, but uh, it's fun to look at some of the sweaters. I've seen some, oh, I like that. That's very good. That's, that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's my favorite way, way to wear a tie, too. It's just yeah, a fake one on a sweater. But, um, but uh, yeah, I'd encourage you to look around. It really is. It's a lot of fun. And you may have noticed there's some tickets. They look like this on your table. We are going to raffle away. We've got four Christmas baskets that Lisa put together. We're going to raffle them away. So we want everybody to take just one ticket. I don't care how many people are at your table. You can only have one ticket. <clears throat> okay, has everybody got a ticket? Because we're going to raffle off our first basket right now. I don't know how this is going to work. How do I do this, Lisa? Th those numbers are so long. Just the last three numbers? Okay, all right. So here we go. Basket number one, and you get to come and pick one of the four, and they're all different. Basket number one is going to ticket number, and I just do the three last numbers. Maybe. Okay, I'm going to do all the numbers. Okay, here it is. Try to pay attention. There, there's a lot of numbers. One, two, two, zero, three, one. Anybody have one, two, two, zero, three, one? Anybody? What? What? No way. All right. So Lisa will ask what, what, um, what, what basket she wants. Oh, that's so cool. I'm glad. That's, that's sweet. All right. So our family, I don't know about your family, but our family is, is big into Christmas. Uh, we always have, oh, no, where are they? Snow. Oh, it's okay. We, we always have, uh, Christmas morning, we do an indoor snowball fight with my grandkids. It is just so much, so much fun. And Lisa brought me some snowballs. Yes, here we go. So, yeah, it's so much fun. We, you know, we, we come all out, and I, I hand out the snowballs, and then I have a perfect way that I do this. Okay. That's, oh yeah. Wow, that, that was impressive. That was impressive. But anyhow, we are, we are so much into Christmas that my daughter, Michaela, she has a couple big lizards for pets. I don't know why, but she, he, this, is, this is her lizard spike. She actually got a, a Christmas outfit for him. And I'm going, Michaela, how'd you get that on him? Well, he's pretty patient with me. But I'm just going, that's hilarious. Um, that's hilarious. Okay, so here's our fun table talk question for this morning. Oh, this, this is maybe my favorite Christmas question. What is your favorite Christmas treat? What's your favorite Christmas treat? Maybe it's a peppermint latte or special cookies or Christmas blend coffee. But for me, if I had to choose just one, and it's really hard, I love me frangos. Oh yeah, dark chocolate frangos. That just says Christmas to me. I, I don't know about you. But, and, but really, I like any kinds of treats except for fruitcake. I don't understand that. Those two words do not go together. I mean, fruit, fruit smoothie, absolutely. Chocolate cake, uh-huh. But fruitcake, no, no. Man, so anybody here like fruitcake? Okay, you have to leave the room right now. I thought we were friends. 
Okay, so I'll let you talk around your table for a little bit. What is your favorite Christmas treat? And then we'll get back together. Right. All right. We're going to have to cut you off. <laughs> I think if we didn't cut you off, you'd talk all day. Don't you think so? That's a good problem. That's a good problem to have. My favorite Christmas treat is fudge. Mm. Mm, friends, fudge. And I, I'm like a pretty simple guy because I just like the plain fudge, not the extra stuff in there. I mean, that can be good, but just plain, just like almost practically inject yourself with butter and cocoa. You know what I mean? Like that's the type of stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty delicious. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, getting sing, to sing some Christmas carols with you today. And uh, I heard some people had requested some Christmas carols. Is that true? Is that true that that had happened? That's awesome. Well, you wouldn't have had to request them because I love me some Christmas carols. And uh, I love thinking about the birth of Jesus. I love thinking about the fact that God, the scripture says at just the right time, in the fullness of time, sent Christ. And uh, my, my family and I, we've been reading through the entire the entire narrative of the Bible. And we happened, we're right at Luke right now. And uh, we just started reading the Christmas story. And it's so incredible. It's so amazing to think that God himself saw our need and knew that we couldn't handle the need on our own. And so he said, you know what? I'm gonna take care of that. I'm gonna step into human history I'm gonna solve the problem they could never solve. I'm gonna live the life they should have lived. And ultimately I'm gonna die the death that they deserve to die. It's incredible. It's incredible. And so we have the opportunity to sing some of these hymns and my, my prayer, I love these songs. I want you to hear me. I love these songs so much, but the truth of God that is in them, I love them even more. I just love God's word and I love the truth of it and the power of God can change us. And let me tell you, friends, it needs to change me and it needs to change you. So why don't you stand if you're able and let's sing these songs. I've asked my friend David to be with me. You guys know David. Come on. Uh, he's playing keyboard and Alicia. Everybody loves Alicia. I love it when she sings. So let's sing this together. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is a night of our dear Savior's birth. Wow, you guys sound good. Keep singing. Long lay the world in sin and ever pine. 
till he appeared and the soul felt its worth a thrill of hope the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn oh fall on your knees oh hear the angel voices oh night divine oh night when Christ was born
get to celebrate baptism today, so I'm going to invite you to have a seat. What we get to participate in today is truly, truly special. Dawn today is, is getting baptized. Today we're celebrating Jesus' first birthday and Dawn's second birthday. And if, yeah. And if you're, if you're new or newer to the church, you may have never seen anybody get baptized. Baptism is for those who have humbly received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's not a guarantee of salvation, but... It's commanded by Jesus for all his followers and it's modeled all throughout the New Testament as a first step of obedience. And what baptism is, is it's a beautiful picture of what, do, what God does in the heart of an individual as they become a Christian. Paul describes it this way in Romans 6. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, we too might walk in a newness of life. So what baptism is, it's a, it's a picture of what God does in a person's heart when they accept him. And as you go underneath the water, it's a picture of the old Don dying uh, and his sins being washed away. And as he comes up out of the water, it's a picture of the new Don that's been changed by Jesus. I, oh man, I, I just love this. Now, it's also a public declaration of your faith in Christ, and that's what we're witnessing here today. So, Don, let me, let me ask you, why, why have you come today to be baptized? So that uh, I can take God as my Savior for the rest of my life and be giving and that like I have been, but just making the change you know, to, to, to making God as number one for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to so you guys have changed me a lot by coming here. Eight months ago, I don't know if you guys remember a pillow I came with, a, this heart pillow. I had open heart surgery, and I was gone flat flatlined, and with the help of my friends and family and your church, this group, and Pastor Jeff here, uh, that I'm w willing and wanting to make this change and be God as my Savior. All right. Okay. Okay, so Don, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. And have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And now it's your intent to follow him for the rest of your life? I will. And it's because of that confession of faith that I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ. Yeah. Here we go. Sorry. And raise your life. is awesome. Praise God. Praise God for what he's doing. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to continue singing some carols together. <clears throat> Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconcile. Joyful ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Christ by highest heaven, Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the
born, hail the heaven born. Hail the heaven born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory. sing our last uh, Christmas carol together. I just want to read a portion of the scripture. And I wasn't necessarily planning to share this, but I just felt compelled by the Spirit to tell you that probably about 10 years ago, I was not really a big fan of Christmas. I really struggled with, and I still do struggle with the commercialization of Christmas. I struggle when I look out and I go, where's Jesus in this? I struggle with all the holiday movies that have nothing to do with the Lord. I struggled with that, but this, I still struggle with it. But I let that rob me of my joy for what Christmas actually was. And so I walked around during the Christmas season very uh, like Scrooge a little bit um, because it was like, oh well, yeah, but no, they are not talking about Jesus. And you know what the Holy Spirit revealed to me? that I wasn't talking about Jesus either. That I was spending so much time critiquing what wasn't about Jesus that I failed to talk about in myself. And when the Holy Spirit convicted me of that, I repented. And ever since that, the Holy Spirit has brought a deep joy to my heart during Christmas. And that's a real change because my predisposition is not joy. Like I'm a melancholy, like, cynic (laughs) that's that's my default position so when you see me being joyful you know the holy spirit is at work (laughs) and my my family can attest to that but i wanted to read this scripture here this is out of luke chapter 2 and i think it's hard for us to realize what it would have been like to live before the messiah had come the longing the deep waiting that the people of Israel had experienced. And I found this text just so moving when I was reading it with my family. It says, at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. He was eagerly waiting. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all the people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. That's who Jesus is. The light to all people, the Savior, he is Christ the Lord. What it would have been like to be there that day, (laughs) to go, God, I can finally die in peace. And the truth is we can all die in peace at any moment because we know who we belong to. And I want to live my life that way. So let's sing this song, the first Noel, the very first Christmas. The first Noel, the angels did say, was to serve where they lay keeping them 
Israel. Heavenly Father, we give you glory. We give you honor. For you did what we could never do. You saw us in our helpless state. You sent Jesus on a rescue mission for us. And Jesus, I'm so thankful that you were obedient to the Father, even to the point of death on that cross. And you rose from the dead because death could not hold a sinless, spotless lamb such as you a glorious king such as you, death could not hold you. And now, Jesus, you sit at the right hand of the Father, glorified for all to see. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives. Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I thank you for the work that you've done in my life. Continue to do that work. See it all the way to completion on the day when our Savior will return once again, but not as a baby, but as a glorious conquering King. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for singing with us and worshiping the Lord today. Have a seat. Again to our worship team. Everybody, thanks again to the Woohoo! Thanks again to Brandy and her team for these wonderful decorations. Yeah. And congratulations again to you, Don, for your commitment to the Lord. And a good morning to all of you. Hey, good morning, good morning. Um, Let's say hello to everybody into computer land that's not here. Hi, everybody. We hope someday to see you here. And in the meantime, have a very Merry Christmas to all of you and to all, all of them there, wherever they are, whether it's here in the state or Yuma, Arizona, where my sister is. Hi, Sue. Nice to see you someday. Well, I will. <laughs> anyway, everybody, please make sure that your phones have been shut off or silenced so that we do not get interrupted. Thank you. We have a, a couple of new people here today. Uh, we want to welcome Faye and Gil Roberts from Phoenix, Arizona. Hello to, Gay, to Gil and Faye, way back there. Phyllis and uh, Vic Spurback brought, I think it's Phyllis's sister, Faye. So nice to see you, welcome. <laughs> we also have Carol Stacy. Carol, where are you? Over here. Welcome, Carol. We're glad that you're here. And welcome to all the guests who are here to partake of our last Encore of the Year, which is our nice, big, fat Christmas celebration. So we're glad that you guys are all here. Um, a couple of announcements. If you didn't catch that, this is the last one of the year. Don't come next week. We won't be here, okay? Um, I have the December bookmarks for your Bible reading pleasure. Do not have the January one yet. So uh, if you need the December ones, I'll have them here at my, uh, my uh, table. Thank you. Let's see what else. We won't talk about <clears throat> the Seahawks today, okay. <laughs> we'll let that go. Well, we should have talked about it last week when they did really good. Anyway, <laughs> all that to say, um, yesterday... For your enjoyment, yesterday's national day was, wait for it, National Poinsettia Day. It was also National Gingerbread House Day. <laughs> Those are great. I don't know who makes up these lists, but they're pretty cool. Today's national day is not quite as good, but it's a national ice cream day. That's pretty good. And also, National Hot Cocoa Day. 
Okay. <laughs> I didn't look to see what tomorrow is. You guys can do that on your own. Okay. So let's get into what I'm really here for, which is the praises and uh, prayer requests. We have a praise from Debbie uh, Benedetto. Where are you sitting, Debbie? Over there. She has a praise. Her brother-in-law, Doug Heinzen, is finished with his chemo and is now on a maintenance program. Thank you for all your prayers. Thank you, Deborah. Let's give the Lord praise for that. <clears throat> and a praise from Linda Green. Where are you sitting, Linda? Over there as well. Praise. Her husband, Clyde Green, is doing fine. It was an episode of AFib, but he followed with the doctor, and Linda learned not to panic. Okay, let's give praise to God for that as well. And David Foose, where are you sitting, David? Whoop. Over, where? I didn't see, oh, there you are. I see you with the hat. Okay. Uh, praise, cataract surgery was successful. I thank the Lord for that. Prayer for continued healing and regaining eyesight with, corrector, with corrections. We will pray for you, Dave. Uh, Mike Blakesley, is he here today? Mike, okay. Mike is asking for prayer. Please pray that he has a heart catheterization today. So, and he's praying for a good outcome. So let's keep Mike in our prayers. Ann Hayden. Please pray that her husband, Bob Hayden, does not have prostate cancer. <clears throat> we found out that this past Friday afternoon, they will find out this Friday afternoon. <clears throat> pray for wisdom, mercy, and peace. They did a biopsy on three lesions that MRI found. Also, praise God, no breast cancer found on test mammogram for you, for Ann. Okay, let's give the Lord praise for that as well. The Lord is at work, and you can see that with all these praises. Um, Kim McCormick is asking for prayer for grandson Dustin. He had a grand mal seizure Friday. No history of it. What is he, 21? 20. He's 20 years old. Blood work is totally off the chart. Pray for doctor guidance and healing of whatever is happening. Kim, we will pray for Dustin. She's also asking for prayer for herself. Her next MRI is Christmas Eve morning on a Saturday morning. Hmm. Praying for clarity and healing for whatever is happening in her back. So, Kim, we will pray for you as well. Pam Ristow is sitting right there. Please excuse me if I have to ask where you are. There's so many people here, I can't figure out where you are unless you raise your hand. So thank you. And that way, people who know, will know who you are. Okay. Um, I guess that's a good thing, right? Um, prayer requests for Algin and Linnea Ristow. They're both very sick. They both have pneumonia. Wow. So let's pray for Algin and Linnea. And Phyllis per, uh, Spurbeck is way over there, Phyllis. She's asking for prayer for Laurel Stewart. She needs a healing touch in her back. We'll pray for uh, Laurel. Also, here's a prayer praise, uh, from Phyllis as well. Her sister, Faye, and husband, Gil, are visiting from Phoenix. We already introduced them earlier. Faye had a kidney transplant in January, last January. Please pray for healing mercy. She's still having issues with it. So let's lift uh, Faye up in our prayers. Um, is it prayer for our friend Doug Hauser? He was in a car accident. He has a, he has a broken neck and many other issues. We just found out he, was, he will be paralyzed. He doesn't want this kind of life. He's ready to go home. This man was, short, uh, was shot down three times in Vietnam and survived, only to end up like this. His wife, Marlene, just this morning brought him to the Lord. <sighs> wow. Praise God for that. Let's continue to pray. Let's lift Doug up in prayer and ask for a miracle there about his, uh, phys his uh, being paralyzed. 
And also, Lord, uh, we want to thank Rosie. Rosie, raise your hand. All these little angels that you see on your table were made by Rosie. Thank you, Rosie. Wow. Well, that's all the news that I have, folks. Um, I just pray that each one of you have a very blessed and Merry Christmas filled with all kinds of fun and family and friends and fireworks and surprises. But most of all, that you feel a very special blessing from the Lord on you. Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> wait a second. But wait, there's more. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to have Carolyn pick our next ticket for the raffle. So get your ticket out. We'll see. Oh, the, what's his name? What's his name? Oh, somebody asked, right? Okay. Okay. Drum roll. Oh. Drum roll. <laughs> Put my glasses on. <laughs> the number is one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm only kidding. <laughs> it's uh, one, two, two, zero, three, zero. Zero, three, zero. Anybody? Check your tickets. Going once. Nobody's going to claim it. <gasps> do we do it again? Yeah. Wait. One, two, two, zero, three, zero. Woo! Same, same, same ta table? Same table. What? Ta what? I, I thought I... Okay, here you go. Okay. Okay. Want to do it again? No, no, no. Ask whoever to come up and pray. I'm sorry, what? Are you ready? Um, I'd like to ask Rick Barcott to come on up and pray for us, please. Woo Merry Christmas, everyone. Oh, did you read my sweater? Okay. This is Christmas. Joy, hope, peace, believe, Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, I'm a little bitter. I, uh, you know, I was going to win the sweater contest. I went to uh, Nordstrom Rack three times. First time I got a small size <laughs> and uh, paid $25. And uh, then I came here and half of you are blinking away and showing me up and, you know, so thanks a lot. Made my Christmas. Okay, I better pray about my bitterness. <laughs> oh. Oh. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have such a joyous, fun time here today. Thank you for the blessings of the season, but I shouldn't say it that way. Thank you for Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us, rose again. Thank you for his birth, this season, celebrate. And Lord, we pray for our dear friends here and, and that are not here that are going through some difficult times, health issues and other issues. We just pray, Lord, that you would uh, speak to them, encourage them in, in all these different ways, Lord. And we just give you praise and glory for all that you've done and all you're going to do. We thank you ahead of time for the healing that you are going to do also. So we give you praise and glory and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, somebody left a phone up here. I don't know whose it is, but I'll sell it afterwards to anybody who's looking for a phone. Um, uh, super excited about this morning. I've asked one of my really good friends, Dr. Jason Hubbard, to come back and teach. He taught for us a couple months ago, and he leads a missions organization called International Prayer Connect. Did I say it right? I say it wrong so often, but what they do is connect a coalition of 5,000 plus different prayer networks around the world involving literally millions of people and it's just incredible what they do and it'll be interesting one day to see the impact of that ministry jason what god does behind the veil when we pray so yeah he's kind of a big deal but he's also a good friend for some reason and uh he loves christmas so i want you to welcome dr jason hubbard up to teach us today oh thanks jeff 
Good. Well, good to be here. I obviously am not winning the Christmas sweater contest. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I do want to get uh, Carolyn's red boots. I want to get some of those for my wife, though. Those are awesome. <laughs> I think this should be named National Shark Day. What do you think? I love the shark. Couple, couple shark dad jokes real quick. What do you think? Who delivers presents to shark children on Christmas? Santa Jaws. <laughs> what did the shark say when he ate the clownfish? This tastes a little funny. <laughs> well, good to be here. Um, just thank you, Jeff, so much. Jeff and Cindy have been our pastors for many years, and you are so blessed to have them uh, be with you here, and it's an honor uh, to come back and share a little bit of testimony about what God's doing and share uh, some uh, uh, principles from Scripture from the Christmas story. There's our website right there, 110cities.com. It's the number 110cities.com. And as I mentioned before, we discovered that 97% of the remaining unreached peoples in the world today live in or near 110 key cities around the world. So in order to fulfill the Great Commission, praying for these cities, for gospel movements, for the salvation of these peoples that are in these cities, uh, is paramount. And so you can find uh, how to pray and join us uh, in praying this next year. Last year when we started this prayer initiative around the world with these different prayer networks, uh, we saw uh, 90 prayer walking teams cover these cities. And again, these are dark cities like Mecca and Ridya and uh, Mogadishu and Jakarta. Big mega cities, very dark, strongholds. And um, as we did that, we also established 24-7 prayer over these cities. And by way of testimony, maybe some of you joined us in praying for these cities. But since January, we've seen 570,000 new house churches planted this last year. Uh, <clears throat> amen. Uh, that's over 8 million new water baptized Jesus followers that are in these house churches. So amazing what God's doing. Let me just give you one quick story because that's a big number. And there's a lot of these little stories that happen in all these cities um, I'm trying to provoke you to want to pray with us next year. Um, so go to, your, go to the website, then you can sign up and take 10 minutes a day or 10 minutes a week, you know, wherever you're at in your prayer life. But here's one story that just, oh, this is confidential, so please don't post this on the internet. That's a pretty, I think it's a pretty good Christmas present for Jesus this year. What do you think? <laughs> so let's give him one again next year. What do you think? Uh, and uh, again, n n none of us can go to places like that. You can't even, you know, you and I can't even go to Mecca, honestly. But we can pray, right? And there's no limit to our prayers and how God can use them. So, amen. Well, I want you to turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke 2, 8 through 21. Very familiar passage. I want to give us um, maybe some fresh insights from this. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. <laughs> I would be too. <laughs> and the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And here's your key verse, and I want you to think about this. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. 
Question for us today, what was it that they saw and what was it that they heard? What caused these shepherds to return glorifying and praising God? What did they know about Jesus that you and I don't know? And what would motivate us this Christmas season to glorify and praise God like we did this morning? Uh, you know, a lot of us have heard these stories for years, and sometimes it's easy for us to get a little bit uh, cynical, maybe a little jaded, maybe at times familiar. We've heard the stories. We've sang the songs. I love the testimony of our brother that was leading worship, and I've been there. Man, I think the Lord wants to rekindle again for us the glory of Christmas, I've been asking that for the last several years. Lord, reawaken my heart to Jesus. Show me your glory again so that I can be like these shepherds and praise you and worship you for all that you are. I want us to take a fresh look at this greatest love story of all time where God's own son shed his garments of glory to become Bethlehem's Lamb. I want you to remember that. Bethlehem's lamb. Uh, this is the story where the author of the book right, steps into his own tale. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. He will make himself vulnerable to pain. Human suffering. He will discover the feeling of a, a tear rolling down his cheek. He will lay his life down as a lamb. And he will conquer sin and death and give eternal life to all those who believe. It's the wonder of the ages, and I believe it's the glory of the incarnation. I think this is the greatest mystery in all of human history. What do you think? God himself now with human skin, the creator, has become a created being. Wow, staggering. He who made man is made a man. The infinite has become an infant. The shepherd of eternity has become Bethlehem's lamb. Here's a great quote from a uh, early church father. It says, your mother is a cause for wonder. The Lord entered her and became a servant. He who is the word entered her and became silent within her. Thunder entered her and made no sound. There entered the shepherd of all, and in her he became the lamb, bleeding as he came forth. Your mother's womb has reversed the roles. The establisher of all, of all entered into his richness, but, be, but came forth poor. The exalted one entered her, but came forth meek. The splendorous one entered her, but came forth having put on a lowly hue. The mighty one entered and put on insecurity from her womb. The provisioner of all entered and experienced hunger. He who gives drink to all entered and experienced thirst. Naked and stripped there came forth from her. He who clothes everyone. Hmm. My uh, son and I love to study uh, the stars and the, and the, the majesty and the, the bigness of creation. And we discovered that some astronomers estimate that neutron stars, these are my favorite ones, neutron stars may actually be 10 trillion times denser than steel <laughs> and can spin at rates of up to 600 times per second. It's really fast. <laughs> Astronomers estimate that the sun is around 27 million degrees Fahrenheit at its core. It's really hot. It burns up around 4 million tons of its own mass every second. <laughs> and it's so huge that even at that rate, it would last another 5 to 6 billion years. The sun is just an average star in the universe among billions of others. In fact, astronomers tell us that there are more than 100 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy alone. A billion is a huge number. For example, you can fit approximately 10 oranges in a large salad bowl, a thousand oranges in the back of a pickup truck, a million oranges in a large swimming pool, a billion oranges would fill a stadium to the brim. Huge number. Job tells us, stop and consider God's wonders. 
I think there's times in the busyness of the Christmas season that we need to take a step back and stand in awe. Genesis says that Jesus spoke these galaxies into existence with sentences. <laughs> he upholds and sustains all things by the power of his word. And yet Job, speaking of this creation, mentions this. He looks back and he says, how faint, this, this creation, how faint the whisper we hear of him. It was just a whisper. Boom. Creation. Who then, I love this question, who then can understand the thunder of his power? None of us. <laughs> Woo. Then to consider that the God who spoke creation into existence as a mere whisper became flesh and he invaded the human race becoming one of us. I mean, just, I mean, to me, I think about this and I go, he, he didn't, you know, not become God. He's still fully God, but he took on human flesh. The rest, I mean, just the restraining power to keep Godness wrapped up in human flesh now. I mean, that is ridiculous. How did that happen? This, this power that, that must have been yielded to keep the second person of the Trinity wrapped up in human flesh. It's astounding. Listen, Christmas doesn't just mark another observance in the church's annual calendar, right? It defines a monumental, unparalleled, unrepeatable moment where the infinite became an infant. It marks a moment when all the all-powerful Son of God steps into weakness in real time and space and history. This requires us to step back and take time to behold. We can't treat this casually, <laughs> right? The New Testament message is that the living God has come to us as one of us. Jesus himself is God among us, right? Permanently united to us. He's taking strategic action to save us. He's for us, to liberate us. And this kind of incarnation requires nothing less than a God-invaded invasion. David Bryant writes it this way, the invasion of the incarnation. I, I want to, you know, it didn't just happen back in history. I, I want that to actually happen in my own personal life, around the dinner table with my kids, and all of a sudden, I am having a living encounter as I behold the God of the universe in the person of Jesus. I believe the incarnation, the doctrine of Jesus is full humanity and full deity is the most extraordinary miracle in all of Scripture. <laughs> Jesus retains unity with the Trinity, amen, and with our humanity, both at the same time. Nobody can understand this. He embodies two natures without confusion and without division. He did not change what he was, God. Rather, he took on what he was not, human. <laughs> the incarnation, again, is the most profound mystery, I believe, in all the universe Bishop of Sardis writes this, he appeared as one of the sheep, yet he still remained the shepherd. He was esteemed a servant, yet he did not renounce his sonship. He was carried in the womb of Mary, yet arrayed in the nature of his father. He walked upon the earth, yet he filled all of heaven. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm talking about. He appeared as an infant. Yet he did not discard the eternity of his nature. He needed sustenance in as much as he was a man. Yet he did not cease to feed the entire world in as much as he was God. Jesus Christ is the all-consuming one. Amen? He is the all-sufficient one, the all-satisfying one, the all-deserving one. He defies all human categories. There is none like him. He has no rival. There's no language that can adequately describe him. He's the incomparable one. He sits in a class all by himself, and he deserves our worship and our praise. Christmas is not really about us. It's about his glory. He's our treasure. He's the one that we love. <sighs> He is indescribable in beauty. He 
He's unfathomable in wisdom. He's unparalleled in power. He's unfathomable in wisdom. There is none like this one. The fountainhead of all glory. Glory that flows from him and through him and back to him. He is outstanding. He is the dazzling one, the radiant one, the chandelier of heaven, and the light of the world. If you love him today, the worth of Jesus is so stunning that the angelic hosts of the heavens collapse under the weight of his glory. Literally, a hundred million angels catch a glimpse of the glory of the Son of God, and they fall down saying, Revelation 5.12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and glory and honor and blessing. The more that we understand the scriptures, the more majestic and magnificent and awesome is Jesus Christ. May our worship, our prayer, our service to him be a direct reflection of that wonder and that awe. Let's go back to the text now. Again, uh, why Bethlehem? Why these shepherds? And again, what did these shepherds have revelation of that caused them to worship and praise God. As the prophet spoke, but you, Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Uh, Bethlehem, right, just seven miles outside of Jerusalem. These were the same hills, of course, where David was a shepherd and tended his lambs. And after God's announcement came to Mary and Joseph, he, he went to the shepherds, right? They were keeping watch over their flocks by night, the text says, which was only done during the lambing season when the baby lambs were being born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was unique because it was the place where lambs were bred for one specific purpose, these were the lambs that were set aside for sacrifice in Jerusalem during Passover. So the lambs that these shepherds were breeding were lambs that were set for slaughter. Wait a minute. <laughs> They're watching their flocks at night, and we all remember the story of what happens right there. The heavens roll open as the glory of God explodes through the sky. They watch thousands of angels in glory, right? The, the, the splendor, and they're declaring the, declaring the glory of Christ. I love this, uh, as Hughes writes in a vision, just kind of picture this, a heavenly flash, and suddenly the bewildered shepherds were surrounded by angels. A great company is literally a multitude. It's not a 50 or not 150, not a 1,500, but beyond count. I think every one of God's angels was there because this was the most amazing event that had ever happened in the entire universe. Job tells us that at creation, the morning stars, angels sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. Right, Job, Job 38, 7. It says, now the angels again joined voices at the greatest creation of all, the birth of the God-man, perfect sympathizer and Savior. That's why we sing during Christmas. They heard the voice of an angel declaring the birth of a Savior. This will be a sign to you. You will see a, ba a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Why is it a sign to them? These shepherds knew and they understand that mangers were used as feeding troughs and were found typically in shepherds' caves, the place where baby lambs were being born. And when a shepherd in Bethlehem, when a, when a baby lamb was being born, in order to protect it, these are very precious lambs, right? They, they had to be lambs that were without defect if they were going to be uh, uh, potential lambs for Passover. And so they would protect them, and they would literally wrap these baby lambs, if you study the history, in swaddling cloths. And then they would place them in these mangers, so when the shepherds came, this is why it was assigned to them. Not only did they hear what the angels said about who Jesus was, awesome. <laughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> but when they got to Bethlehem, they understood that he wasn't just Christ the Lord, but he was the Lamb of glory. They're like, wait, 
This, this one, the Christ, will be a lamb. And oh, these are the lambs that, that we watch over that will one day be sacrificed during Passover. Christ the Lord, the Passover lamb. <laughs> wow. I think that's why in the greatest love story ever told, Jesus was Bethlehem's lamb. A great story uh, in church history is a story of this people called the Moravians. A small group of persecuted refugees that were fleeing modern-day Czech Republic to Germany. And they were met by a man by the name of Count Zinzendorf. He was a wealthy aristocrat, a nobleman by birth, and he gave them refuge on his estate. Uh, this man was often described as the rich young ruler who said yes and gave up all of his wealth for the sake of the gospel and because of the absolute worth of Jesus Christ. This small community uh, on June 17th of 1722 felled the first tree to build the first home in this community. And this year marks the 300-year anniversary of these Moravian refugees. Uh, it was a small period of, a, of about five years where they were infighting, they had dissension with one another, and they couldn't get along, kind of like the rest of us when it comes to trying to live together in community and family. <laughs> Anybody have just this wonderful family? It's perfect. <laughs> Everything comes out at Christmas, right? <laughs> yeah. They're just like us. But in, in, in five years later, uh, Zinzendorf heard about this infighting and bitterness and offense, and he, he came as a shepherd of this small community and went home to home as, as, a, as a shepherd pastor, and he pleaded with them to be reconciled with one another. You know, because of the cross of Christ and because of the worth of Jesus and, and the blood of Jesus, we need to treat one another the way that Jesus treats us, and we need to forgive one another. None of us deserve the grace of God more than another, amen? And uh, as, as the Spirit began to work in their hearts, uh, they still had quite a bit of division, but in the summer of 1727, they're on their way to a communion service. Still pretty divided. They were kind of walking on two sides of the street still. <laughs> it's a bad idea when you're going to have communion together. <laughs> Not a lot of unity. <laughs> they get to the church. Zinzendorf again begins to plead. Um, begins to preach with unction around the revelation of Jesus crucified. They we're coming to this table, and the Spirit of God begins to move on their hearts, and one gets up and reconciles with another, and they forgive one another, and they release their offenses and their bitterness. And as they come together in one accord, the Spirit of the living God fell afresh upon them. The love of God was poured out into their hearts by the Holy Spirit and poured out in love for one another. Amazing story. And out of that love for one another and, you know, receiving the love of God through the gospel, they committed to pray night and day, day and night. For a hundred years, they prayed nonstop unceasing prayer. It was called hourly intercession. It was a hundred year prayer meeting that literally changed the world. As they prayed night and day under this canopy of united strategic and sustainable prayer, God began to send missionaries to the ends of the earth. They launched 300 plus missionaries and they established over 5,000 different missionary settlements around the world. Most astounding story in church history next to the book of Acts. Their purpose and mandate was this. To win for the lamb who was slain the due reward for his sufferings. He 
He was worthy of their prayer. He was worthy of their worship. He was worthy of their obedience. He was all deserving of the affections of the nations of the earth. And they were willing to give up anything and go anywhere for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's what motivated them to pray and go on gospel mission. Like those shepherds in scripture, they had an encounter with the lamb of glory, with Bethlehem's lamb. And it's my heart for us here today that we would have an encounter this Christmas. The spirit of God would illuminate the word of God to us and reveal Jesus and him crucified. Reveal Bethlehem's lamb to us this Christmas season. When uh, Zinzendorf uh, had opportunity, he went on mission himself from Herrenhut, Germany. Herrenhut means the watch of the Lord, and they were standing under the Lord's watchful care, and they were giving themselves to be watchmen posted on the walls, praying night and day. And uh, Zinzendorf was sent out on mission, and in 1741, he came to America, to our nation. And it was on a Christmas Eve service where he dedicated a small community, day and night prayer, missions. They were using their gifts to serve the community and share Christ. Uh, and it was on this Christmas Eve service that he gets this sense from the Lord to name this new city in our nation, Bethlehem. <laughs> Another movement happened down in North Carolina in this profound, sacrifice of these Moravian believers where they had made covenant, built friendship with uh, the Cherokee Indians. And uh, you remember the Trail of Tears, right? So many of these Cherokee Indians were displaced and removed from their land. And these Moravian believers loved them so much that they left their land as well and walked that Trail of Tears with them and many of them gave their lives. Amazing story. I, uh, because of this year being the 300-year anniversary of the Moravians, I wrote a short little book here called The Moravian Miracle, the 100-year prayer meeting that changed the world. I share some of these stories in, in here. Uh, and so they're over on the, the uh, table there. Love for you to grab one of these. Um, be so honored if you could give us a just small donation. I'm a missionary, and we live on the support of believers like you. Um, if you can't afford to give a donation, just take one, grab a whole bunch. I got about 50 copies, so first come, first serve. Um, but I think you'll be inspired by this story and asking the question, you know, what would it look like today to see a modern day Moravian movement restored? See that lampstand restored in our day. Let me close with this. Uh, it's not just about standing in awe, but it's also about beholding the lamb so that we can draw close to him in intimacy. I think that's kind of what defines prayer. It's both awe, it's an encounter with the Holy God, but it's also intimacy. It's a living conversation with a real person that loves us so much. That's what I think, uh, if I'm gonna define prayer, it would be the conversational part of the most important love relationship in our lives. What was the motivation in God's heart? Sending his son. What was the motivation in Jesus' heart to be willing to come as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world? I believe it was his love for you and I, his dedication towards you and I, to think that this God is the God who pursues us, who takes delight in us, who rejoices over us with gladness, who quiets us by his love, who rejoices over us with loud singing. The Lord loves you so much. You are the object of his affections, the very dream of his heart. He loves you so much that he was willing to come to us as one of us. Let's spend this Christmas season beholding Jesus, the Lamb of glory, in both intimacy and awe. Father, I thank you for this uh, Christmas season, Lord. And I'm asking that you would pour out the Holy Spirit upon us. And Spirit of God, would you reveal the Lord Jesus to us as Bethlehem's Lamb. Help us draw near. Help us to slow down.
Help us to have an encounter that would change our lives forever like our brother that was baptized today. Lord, we rejoice today that you are rejoicing over us, that you love us. In fact, we know we can't love you unless you first love us. So God, I pray that you would open up our hearts Lord, this Christmas season and help us to encounter your love, the Lamb's love, Bethlehem's Lamb of glory. We love you, Lord, today. We pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus. And all God's people said in agreement. Amen. God bless you. Uh, yeah, Jason, thank you so much. Anybody learn anything new this morning? Man, I just, <laughs> I love Jason's heart. And thanks for great reminders, great reminders for us. Okay, I, Carolyn mentioned it, but I want to say it again. After today, we'll be taking a couple-week break. Uh, and we'll meet again on January the 2nd. So put that on your calendars. And then we'll dive back into the book of... Third? Oh, third. Okay. Well, you can show up on the 2nd. I won't be here, apparently. But, uh, yeah, I, I get that wrong all the time. What's wrong with me? Um, but anyhow, so January 3rd. So put that on your calendars. We'll dive back into the Gospel of John. Probably my favorite story in the Gospel of John. Also one of the most controversial ones. But that's, that's January Third. Okay. All right. Okay. And if you haven't noticed yet, uh, Pastor Steve and Pastor Dave Morgan are in the back right there. So just say, say hi to them. Uh, what in the world? And I don't know if you noticed their sweaters. Dave, where did you get that? That's awesome. It's almost as cool as my shark sweater. Not, not quite. But idiot. so I'm going to walk back there. We're going to raffle off our last two. Uh, what do we call them? Baskets, yeah. Yeah, our last two baskets. Yeah, that's what I'm, I was going to. All right, so I'll let what, each of you pick one. So what in the world? What is that? I don't know. You don't, <laughs> did your wife get that for you? No, my mother-in-law did. Your mother, okay, all right. Well, that, that says everything. Okay, now I understand. Okay, all right, so pick one. And what's the number? Okay, one, two, 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 seven. Anybody? Anybody? One, two, 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 seven. Over there? Okay, so you can run to the stage. Run to the stage real quick and grab your basket. Okay, and then Dave, it's your turn to pick one more. This is our last one. Our last one. Go. Are you ready? One, two, two, one, three, eight. One, two, two, one, three, eight. All right. Okay. So we've officially got rid of all our baskets. That is so cool. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is, as scary as it is, is hand the mic to Lisa. <clears throat> and she's going to talk us through how we'll get lunch. And then I'll, I'll close this up before we go. Okay. We have some helpers today. <laughs> And they're still coming. Okay, on your tables, you guys, you have red. There are some red cards. If you would like one of these wonderful people to go out and get your lunch, if you have a walker or a cane or you just don't feel like walking out there, I want you guys to hold up your card. They are going to come meet you, and then they will go out and get your lunch. And we want to let these guys go first. So who needs help getting their lunch? I need you to hold up a red card. Hold them high. Okay, you go see Marilyn over there. You guys can go ahead and go down, start walking through and look for red cards, meet who needs their lunch. I see somebody in the back. I see Carolyn's in the back. Way in the back back there. Way in the back in the corner back there. Carolyn, raise it higher. Piper, go all the way in the back back there. Okay. And then they're going to start bringing their lunch in, and then I'm going to... This is Ray Lynn. She's going to help me dismiss it by tables. So hang tight, and we'll come start letting you guys go. We want you to go out the back doors, because that's where the plate in starts, and then come back in the doors over here. There is lemonade and water on the back table, and there is still some coffee. Does that make sense? Okay. 
All right, so again, Lisa will be out there to dismiss you by tables. A couple last announcements real quick. Uh, if you enjoy the treats that we have each Tuesday, we need you to sign up to uh, bring some treats in January, okay? So the sign-up sheet is at the prayer table over there. You can sign up to bring treats uh, beginning in January. And then, last thing, when you're done eating, you can go ahead and, and feel free to go home, but don't feel like you have to rush out. This is too much fun being together today. This is, this, is, this is awesome. So let me pray for us, and then we'll start dismissing tables. Father, just thank you so much uh, for our time together. Thank you for Jason, Dr. Jason Hubbard, bringing us the word, and for those great reminders. You came because of your deep love for us to sacrifice your life so could, we could have a relationship with you. Not a bigger birthday party we could celebrate than, than your son. Thank you. And today, as we enjoy this, food, this great food, I just pray that we'd have great talk around the table and just enjoy our fellowship with, with, with each other. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen.